Stephen Semple, and we're talking about businesses and innovation and ideas that take a business from tiny to empire. There's usually something that they turn on, something that they come across, they figure out, and it makes all the difference. Today we're talking about, boy, this is, this is another one of those that bridges the brick and mortar and online world. And a bit of a disruptor, if I'm not mistaken, you said we're doing Warby Parker today. And I know that they're an online eyeglass company and I don't know much else. Well, they are an online glass company and they now have, gosh, I forgot to look up how many stores they have, but they now have a few hundred stores. So they've started to open brick and mortar. But the part of the story we want to talk about is what they did when they were just strictly an online business because they went to the brick and mortar, you know, later. So again, the idea of these stories is to talk about the early days, what turned them into an empire. And that was when they were online. So I'm gotcha. where we're gonna focus today on the online part. But you know, they were founded in 2010 is when they started by Neil Blumenthal, David Gilboa, Andy Hunt, and Jeff Rader. And in September of 2021, they went public with a valuation of almost seven billion dollars. So when they went public, yeah, seven billion. Seven billion. Seven. That's a little bit of a payoff, eh? Yeah, no kidding. Yeah. So founded in 2010, 11 years later, seven billion dollars. Wow. So the idea started in 2008, and basically, what happened is the guys were together and they were sharing their frustration with losing glasses and the cost to replace them. And and these guys all met at the Wharton School of Business. They were students there. And they all had this common frustration of buying glasses and they kept losing them. And the example that got them started was Dave talking about leaving glasses on an airplane. He left his glasses on the airplane and they cost $800. And mm. at the same time, now think about this. You know, it's different today when we look at the price of an iPhone. But in 2010, you could buy an iPhone for $200. And he's standing there going, this iPhone is 200 bucks and these plastic glasses are 800. This makes no sense to him. Yeah. And Andy, who liked buying things online, was frustrated that he couldn't easily buy glasses online. And they felt like the technology of how glasses were made and sold felt so antiquated. And when they got talking about it, it turns out, like, like talk about this weird connection. They get talking about it, it turns out Neil had experience in the glasses space. He had oh, spent wow. a num yeah, he had spent a number of years working for an eyewear nonprofit. So he had been going to factories and buying glasses as cheaply as possible to be giving away in these third world countries. And this started a conversation. Okay. Right. And Neil had even been involved in the designing of this stuff and taking it to the factory. So he knew the business. And it turns out what he shared with them is that the business was dominated by a handful of players, companies mm -hmm. like Lexotica. Luxottica is a $30 billion business. They make Oakley's, they make Ray-Ban, they make Arnett, just to make a few. They license everyone, Ralph Lauren, Chanel, yeah. Prada. They own Lens Crafters, Pearl Vision, Sunglass Hut, Sears Optical, Target Optical. They also own the second largest eye medical insurance provider. <laughs> so they basically own everything. They own most of the brands, they own Second largest insurance company, and they own most of the places we go to buy this stuff, all under one company. And they realized that what they wanted to do was disrupt the industry. Okay. The more they talked about it, they couldn't sleep. And one day, they meet at a bar over beers, and they say, we should go after this. And they all agree. Now, here's the thing that's really fun. They're all in business school at the time. Mm, okay. Now, part of the program was to create a business plan. So they decided this was going to be their project was create a business plan for this eyeglass company. They got feedback, they met with professors, they spent, now here's another interesting part, they spent hours in optical shops. And I think we don't spend enough time. Yes, you should go to other retailers who are competitors to learn from, but you should go to your competitors, not to see what your competitors are doing, but to observe how customers are buying. Listen yeah. to their conversations, see how they interact with things, be that fly, on the wall. So they spent hours in optical shops and they ended up writing a 40 page business plan. 
and they enter a competition, school of business competition, and they got eliminated in the semifinals. They weren't good enough to go to the finals. And now they're like, oh boy, I can't believe we didn't win this thing. We really got something to prove. <laughs> so they get their competitive ire up. And so at this point, they have a paper, 40 pages, they have an idea, but no product and no ability to manufacture it and no way to sell it. But I got an idea yeah, and, wow. and 40 pieces of paper. And they got lots of pushback to this idea because it was strange to buy glasses online. Like we weren't buying things as much online and glasses are something, well, I want to see it on my face. I want to try it on, right? And here's the other thing they were told. They were told it's hard to create a brand, which is true. They're also told it's hard to create an online store, which is also true. Yeah. But because of that, they were told you need to choose one or the other. You either focus on building the brand and sell it through others, or you focus on building an online store and sell other people's brands. And they were like, no, we actually want to do both. Yeah. So they decided to go down and do both because they saw the magic of online. They just knew that online would work. But the big barrier in online... This is where they were smart. People would say to them, but people want to try on glasses before buying them. That's why they won't shop online. They then flipped the question on its head and said, how can we make it easy for people to try on glasses and buy online? Yeah. They didn't go, oh, that's wrong. Or they didn't go, oh, you're right. There's nothing there. They went, okay, that's true. Now, how do we flip that on its head and make that no longer a barrier? Yeah. Yeah. Because what they realized, people need to touch and feel it and try it on. And at that moment, they felt really challenged. And they started looking at every obstacle that they could think of. Every obstacle, every piece of what we like to call in sales and marketing friction and remove all of them. Anytime something came up as friction, how could we, how could we do it? Free shipping, free returns. Yeah. Then they created this try-on program. And the try-on program is they send you the frames, you try them on. If you like them, send them back and we'll put lenses in them. Yeah. Right? The other problem, like which was brilliant, I can now try on the glasses in my home. Take my time. Ask all my friends, whatever, right? The other problem is product normally is really expensive. Like we were talking about $800. Yeah. What they want to do is sell for under $100. Now... Here's one of the things that got pointed out to them is that this can create skeptics about quality. You can go too low. Mm -hmm. Their initial idea was they were going to do them for $45. They were told that that was too inexpensive and they did a lot of research around price and they found there's a psychological barrier around $100. So they felt they could just go under $100 to achieve their objective, but not be seen as being cheap. Because there's lots of research out there that price and quality match and if price is too low, an outsider will not believe that there's any quality. So they wanted to have a price point low enough that they could get to as many people as possible because they wanted to get glasses on as many faces as possible, but high enough that people would actually believe that there's quality. So they settled on $95. Now here's a fun part. Real debate about the name of the company. They had all sorts of different names. And finally, they landed on Warby Parker. And Warby Parker comes from characters in a Jack Kerouac book, Warby Pepper and Zach Parker. Okay. Warby Parker. And they also thought, you know, when you put Warby Parker together, it sounded kind of cool and different. And all Yeah, it does. It's got, it's good. It rolls off the tongue. It's not hard to, I was going to say, it's, it's, it's not that it's easy to remember and it's not that it's hard to forget. It's just, it's, it's, it's unique enough. Yeah, it's yeah. different. It's different. Now, they used their life savings, each one of them, when they put it together. They had $120,000 that they were able to pull together to do this. And basically, they went 15 months before raising funds. That was enough money to get them through that. And even when they raised funds, it was really leveraging the relationships that they had, right? Mm -hmm. Now, the other thing is, because there was this experience of buying glasses for nonprofits, they're able to leverage relationships in terms of the factories. So they knew the factories to go to, but they still had to pitch them. And it turned out they had to pay for the frames up front. Manufacturers were not going to put them on credit or anything like that. And they had to store all of them in their apartment. Like when their first shipment showed up, it took them hours to unload and they inspected every frame. So this 120000 they invested in inventory and website and also PR. 
They hired, they interviewed a bunch of PR companies, and hired one of the top PR firms out there because what they knew is they only had one shot to launch a brand. And before mm. launch, they hired a publicist. They met with 50 PR firms. They wanted to find a good fit. And look, a lot of the PR firms even weren't interested in them. There's nothing sexy about four MBAs launching a fashion business. And I need to add four MBA students launching a fashion business. So they knew they were launching in spring of 2010. They really wanted to be in premier magazines because they also understood the halo effect. We talked about this in Black Pearls, right? Mm -hmm. If you're in Vogue and GQ, you're suddenly fashionable. Yeah. They were targeting those magazines to get into. And they had production samples, but no site yet. They wanted launch partners. And they found out that GQ and Vogue were going to do an article. So the mm. real key was finding the right PR firm. Stay tuned. We're going to wrap up this story and tell you how to apply this lesson to your business right after this. Two words, lead flow. If you want to grow your business, lead flow is, well, not everything, but it sure can feel that way. You feel the need, the need for leads. And then there's the gnawing questions that plague you whenever you try to boost lead flow. Are you targeting the right customer? Are you saying the right things? Are you advertising in the right places? Are you spending too much or too little? And the ever-present, how can I best use social media? What if you could get those questions answered definitively in 90 minutes? You'd no longer feel the need for leads because now you'd know how to get them. That's what Empire Builders is offering you right now for free and with a guarantee to boot. Go to empirebuildersprogram.com, book a 90-minute Zoom meeting with the Empire Building expert, and boom! Questions answered, problems solved. We'll give you the real answers, guaranteed. Guaranteed. Yes, our famous no pitching and no bitching guarantee. First, we won't pitch you at all, seriously. If you want to work with us beyond our meeting, you'll have to explicitly ask about moving forward. And the bitching part? If you're not satisfied with the answers, say the word. And I'll pay you cold hard cash for your wasted time. No hard feelings. Now that's a guarantee. Look, empire builders take action. If lead flow is an issue for you, take action on it. Book your Zoom meeting at empirebuildersprogram.com. Let's pick up our story where we left off, and trust me, you haven't missed a thing. And the message was novel at the time. The price point was novel. The home try-on was novel. But here's what they needed. They needed an idea that suddenly made sense to the consumer. All right, you know how we often will talk about connecting the known with the unknown? Yeah. This was brilliant. Is this, is that they got labeled as the Netflix of eyewear. Oh, there you go. If you remember, Netflix at the time was, they would send you a DVD, you would watch it and send it back. What these guys yeah. were sending you glasses that you would try on and then send them back. Suddenly somebody could get their head around the try on program. Oh, it's like Netflix. Yeah. Attach the unfamiliar to the familiar. So here's the crazy thing. They find out this article's coming out the next day and they don't have the website up yet. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. So they stay up all night, get the website up and working, and the next day they are in class. Yes, these guys are still in school. The next yeah. day they are in class and they're sitting in class, told no one the site was live, unsure if the site's gonna work, and they had their iPhone set up to notify when orders came in. Immediately in their class and all their phones are going nuts. Oh, wow. Orders are coming in. Lots of orders. Next problem they suddenly realize, there's so many orders coming up, they don't have enough inventory. They're sold out. But they yeah. did not build a sold out or a wait list. Oh, no. <laughs> so they basically rush out of their class and make this emergency telephone call to their web people to build this wait list function. Within four weeks, not only are they sold out, they have a wait list of 20,000 customers. Oh it took gosh. them nine months to work through that wait list. That's amazing. But it created this buzz and this aura of scarcity. Like at first they thought this was a problem. It actually made it feel more special for people. And one of the things they also did, the founders personally reached out to everyone on the wait list personally mm. reached out to them. They had a bad experience. They addressed it personally. The first person they hired, 
who's still with them was a person for answering the phone and running customer help. Wasn't a new technology person, was a person yeah. to take care of customers. And it was an overwhelming amount of work in the early days. They tried to borrow money to fund inventory. They went to 18 banks. But so even with all this, they went to 18 banks and only one would talk to them. You know, wow. this was right after the financial meltdown. So banks were mm -hmm. really tight. And most banks had this rule that they couldn't lend you money if you didn't have two years of tax returns. Well, they were students. They didn't have two yeah. years of tax returns. And they ended up getting this special loan, 200000 SPA loan. So that's something in the States. and SBA, but, yeah. Yeah. So they got that, but then they were also working with a logistics company. And the CEO saw all the things going on and he went to them and he said, you know, could you do some PR consulting for us? You know, and they were like, sure. And he was like, I'll pay you a couple hundred grand to do that. So that gave them more money to fund their business. And the turning point, though, emotionally for them was the first time they saw somebody in public wearing their glasses. Nice. And they, and they yeah. literally like followed the person. Oh my God, they've got our glasses on, right? <laughs> <laughs> but I can understand that as a business owner, that's the moment it really became, even though you're doing all these orders, the first time they saw it in public. So in 2019, they continued to innovate, remove friction, because in 2019, they introduced a virtual try-on augmented reality app, where basically you can see a picture of yourself wearing the glasses. Mm -hmm. And this was recognized by Time Magazine as one of the 100 best inventions of 2019 was this augmented reality app. And now Warby Parker has some brick and mortar locations to support all of this. But really the beginning was this online. And the other part that's so cool, these guys were in school while they're, imagine that they're sitting in their class and their phones are going bing, 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 bing. It's like, oh my God, we're getting all these orders. And they're in business, Wharton Business School. And their business plan was not the best business plan. <laughs> <laughs> but there's a couple of really important lessons here that I really admire. Like they originally just created a price point and one of the professors said, you got to think about price point more importantly. Yes, there's this price point in terms of making your market broad, but if you make it too low, it won't be seen as the quality you want. Really research that price point. And they spent a lot of time on that. But the other part was when people said folks won't buy glasses because they need to try them on to buy them. I love how they flipped the question of, well, how can we get it to them yeah. to buy it? So they looked at the business from the consumer's point, combination of their own frustration and the frustration consumers were feeling and didn't dismiss those things, worked hard to eliminate every one of those friction points, every one of those friction points. And then in the early days, stayed involved with customers. They handled customer complaints personally. They followed up with customers personally so that they could learn. Because yeah. look, a complaint's a friction point. Okay, let me learn about this. And they had a launch strategy. So many businesses start without that. They had a launch strategy. And their idea was PR. They knew where they wanted to get and they built a strategy for that and then that strategy led them this idea of applying the familiar to the unfamiliar to make it more comfortable for consumers sure they did that as a startup but even existing businesses can do that remove the friction remove the friction amen the ceo should work the customer complaints line for a little while mm -hmm. talk to those people it's, it's so important so important for businesses to talk to their customers. And, and they tend to leave that in the hands of their, you know, the newest hires and the, the store, the, the, the clerks, the technicians, the, but the business owners need to be out and. They do. Because otherwise the feedback you're getting is there's a person in the call center who took the call, who noted down the things, who then handed it to the supervisor. And then somebody creates a report that lumps it all together and gives you the summary. That's complicated, right? Remember as kids, we played that game of telephone, 12 people in a row, yeah, and you would just yeah. say a sentence. By the time it got to the end line, it was nowhere like how it started. How do you think this feedback is working in businesses well, when it if, goes through the seven layers of people before it gets to the CEO? <laughs> and five or six of those layers are, are people that are likely going to go, well, I, this customer, just, nobody's going to make him happy. At Warby Parker, they said, how do we make them happy? Right? They're not happy. How do we make them happy? Not nobody can make them happy. What do we have to do? Absolutely. And that's a great point, David, because the feedback that you get is also going to be tempered by 
A, I want to make sure that I don't look bad or my department looks bad, so I'm going to temper the feedback a little bit that way. I'm going to have my own views. I'll know that customer is just being unreasonable and all those other things, which means, yeah, mm-hmm. you're not going to get, there's no way you're going to get accurate feedback, so spend more time with your customers. Work those phones for a few hours. Hear those complaints. Reduce that friction. Yeah, reduce the friction. And that's what uh, Warby think... Parker was all about, was reducing price friction and then the experience yeah. friction. I think they still are focused on that, yeah. Yeah, well look, in 2019, the augmented reality. So they continued to innovate in yeah. that front. So good for them, right? Cool story. Thank you, Stephen. All right, thanks, David. Thanks for listening to the podcast. Please share us. Subscribe on your favorite podcast app and leave us a big, fat, juicy five-star rating and review. And if you have any questions about this or any other podcast episode, email to questions at the Empire Builders Podcast.com.